version of the 504-88 policy there that has all the district information um, in there as, as part of the first read that's going to be happening. So this is an odd one in that um, because it's the reorganization meeting, that's the purpose of tonight's meeting um, primarily. Um, superintendent typically runs the meeting until the election of the board chair. And then at that point in time, the facilitation gets handed over to the board chair. So to start off with, um, again, goal of the meeting, purpose of the meeting is reorganization after the March vote. Um, we'll start off with public comment. Um, just a, a reminder, um, the meetings are designed to allow the board to conduct the business of the district. And so the board does invite uh, public comment from those who would like to speak regarding items that are included in the agenda. Um, if you would like to speak, uh, start by stating your name, your town, and then we try to limit comments to three minutes to give everybody an opportunity. Stand up or sit down. Or what, whatever you're comfortable with. I've never been here before. Good evening. My name is Erin Wakefield and I live in Brookfield. I am here to call an emergency meeting about the mask policy. The governor today, as, a, of, as well as the AOE, stated that masks will be optional as of the 14th of March to give school districts time to prepare. Why wait? Vote on it tonight. I have three sons who are enrolled in this supervisory union. An almost three-year-old, a four-year-old, and a 14-year-old. All three children have individual education plans. I'm a former special education teacher myself, and over the past two years, I have seen the impact remote learning, hybrid learning, and returning to schools with masks have had on all of my children. My youngest son has autism and has yet to see his teacher's faces, yet to see the majority of the people in his community's faces. How incredibly challenging it has been to us, for us to get him to look at others Yet when there's masks on people's faces, it's like they don't even, that he doesn't even realize they're talking to him. My four-year-old has speech for articulation. He does not say the, the sounds for L, F, T, C, G, Q, and K. All of these sounds are done with your mouth, tongue, lips, and teeth. He sees his speech teacher's mouth twice a week for 30 minutes. He has yet to see his friends, teachers, and parents' mouths inside the building. How can he work on articulation when he can't see others do it. My 14 year old has been impacted the most, socially and, edu and educationally awkward to begin with. This pandemic is only highlighting all of his challenges. His ADHD, his intellectual disabilities, make it challenging for him to stay focused and attentive to work. Add computers for remote learning and hybrid learning, as well as masks for in-person, and it seems to not be there at all. I have pushed his IEP, his IEP team for more than two days of in-person learning at the very beginning of this and up to four days a week for last school year. He never got five days of school. This school year, he started with five days, five days. He was vaccinated May, 20, May 2021 and I jumped on the opportunity to have him not have to wear a mask. He was vaccinated before the end of the school year in hopes that this school year he would return to five full days of school without a mask. The mask stayed on, even during his baseball and his basketball games. His special education services throughout this have been incredible. And I'd like to thank his teachers, his parents, his special educators, and his administrators for truly working outside the box to teach him. Please let him also see their faces. Take off the masks. Let him see their faces, connect with them in their classroom. He zones out, is confused. When someone starts talking to him, he becomes annoyed, becomes frustrated that he doesn't see that they're talking to him because he can't see his lips moving. He doesn't even know that they're even talking to him. It's been hard for him to make connections socially with his peers um, that he didn't previously know. Monday, March 14th is too long to continue to wait for this change. Our children need this option to take their masks off and to be able to socialize with the facial expressions they were born with. The right to take the piece of cloth off their face and prevent them from reading and understanding our language, how we're supposed to express it. To quote our governor from today's conference, we need to start living again, not be in a constant state of fear. 
Please start with this tomorrow, not the 14th. We are at the end of this pandemic, says the, the President of the United States. Do it tonight. My name is Brooke, I'm from Randolph. I came because of your post. Thank you. I'm proud Thank of it you. and uh, I, I respect it and I'm on that side as well. Uh, and this really is the last place I want to be. This is the last side I want to take, but um, it's my kids and I don't want them to wear masks anymore. And this is America, I'll fight for my freedom. So here I am. Thank you. That's it. Thank you. Other public comments tonight? Uh, I'm John Helfant, uh, partly in West Brookfield, partly in East Roxbury. My kids attend uh, here at the uh, OSSD. Um, they stole my thunder, so I won't talk too much about masks. I would uh, concur with them. You should end this tonight. I mean, what another 10 days? I mean, come on, really. Uh, it's not going to matter. Um, we should just be done. You can send out an announcement like we do for snow days and just tell everybody masks are optional. You can do it tonight. It's a pretty easy thing to do. So I would highly recommend that the board do that. Uh, I wanted to start off with this, the people and the board members, congratulations. I know some of you have changed. So uh, I wanted to throw that out there. Next thing I'd like to talk about is flag policy. Uh, this flag policy that the last board started and you're gonna hopefully adopt, I, I would urge you to adopt it. I like this a lot. I think this is where it should be. Uh, I do have a question, and I know the board doesn't usually answer questions. Maybe the superintendent can. Um, it says the the district will only fly the Vermont and United States flags on school flagpoles. I was wondering what the definition of a school flagpole was. Are we talking about the flagpole attached to the building or all flagpoles? Basically, on the property. Anything that's on school grounds. Okay then I, I fully promote this flag policy. I think it's a, a good one. Nothing against the BLM flag. It's just, I think the district would get in this mucky war of what flags do we want to fly here or there, for how long and all this. So I, I'm glad to see this, um, this flag policy. Um, I had one other topic, but uh, it's really not. Um, in this meeting format, so I guess I'll leave it alone. I'm good. Thanks. Thank you. Other public comments? Uh, public comment um, from any folks that are logging in remotely? Hearing none, um, we'll move on to the next piece, choosing an evaluator for tonight's meeting. Uh, Linda, do you have a copy of the yeah. evaluation form? Yeah. 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 Same things that are on all the agendas that are out there in the order might be a little, a little lost, so I apologize. I compared them, and mine had the times on it, that's why I went with this one. Okay. Just over here. I put times on it. So, what we are going to do um, is we're going to move on to monitoring the organization. And the first thing is introducing our new board member, is Sarah Hopp, who's representing um, Randolph. Um, did you get an opportunity to get sworn in today? I did, yes. Awesome. So you, you are, you're solid, set to go. And Ann Kaplan, also representing Randolph, who is returning. Um, and did you get an opportunity to get sworn in? Yes. So we're good to go there. Um, just so folks know um, and welcome, the Brookfield board position does remain open. Um, we had no candidates 
Um, we did have a few folks that had received some uh, write-ins, um, but none of them met the threshold to actually become the candidate based upon the number of write-ins that we had. Um, we have notified the Brookfield Select Board, um, and then we currently have 30 days to advertise for the position. Um, then to seek the Brookfield Select Board's recommendation and then for the OSSD Board um, to vote to appoint an applicant. And Linda was preparing the um, advertisement to go out in the, the Herald um, just this morning. Um, that will also be posted on French Forbes. French? French? Forbes. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a long day. Um, as well as the website. And it'll go out in one of my community emails. So. Next piece here um, is election of the board chair. Um, basically, how this will work is I'll ask for nominations, um, and then we will go through depending upon the number of nominations that we have, and, and we will vote on each. Um, so, nominations for board chair for this coming year. Nominate Andy. Please try. Is there? Is there a second? Are there other nominations? Hearing none, it is moved and seconded that Ann, Camp Ann Kaplan um, be elected chair of the school board. All those in favor, raise your hand. Looks like it's unanimous. So I won't ask for names or extensions. It is now accepted that Ann Kaplan is the chair of the school board. I now hand over facilitation to this meeting. So we're going to move on uh, to the election of the vice chair. Um, so do we have a nomination for the vice chair? I nominate Katja Evans. We have a second. Second is by Hannah. Uh, any other nominations? All those in favor of Katya Evans as the vice chair, please say aye. 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 Whatever you say. And it's unanimous. Um, we need to elect the clerk. Uh, I'm, I'm firing myself. I'm terrible at it. <laughs> I think if I didn't lend a word. I know, so I would not so fire you. Great. 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 No, in getting them timely to make okay. that terrible. No. Anyone else as well? Do we have any nominees? Are any I nominate Chelsea because I can see that she's wavering. So there you go. I'll second. Oh. Oh, what do I do? I don't even know. All right. Okay. You you will take notes when we have executive session. Oh. Okay. And and pretty much just in and out, and then if there's a vote. Is yeah. there a form? No. Yep. Yes. yes. Ann has a form for tonight. I bring forms every time. Okay. Only time I'd be involved if I'm sick or something, I can't be here. <laughs> I, I can help. Okay. Great. So is there a form for tonight? But I don't have to do it. Anymore. Executive session form. Okay. Um, Ann's yeah. got one in her. Okay. Yep. Great. And Hannah, you'll help her out. Absolutely. Let's do everything <laughs> differently. <laughs> okay. uh, so do we have anyone else interested in work? Seeing none, all those in favor of Chelsea Sprague as clerk, please say aye. 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 Okay. Um, all righty. So next, uh, we have our meeting schedule that's in the packet. Um, so we're going to continue with the Thursday meetings and 6 p.m. meeting time unless we have any concerns about the meeting time and day. Thursdays are good for everybody. Mm -hmm. 6 p.m. is good for everybody. Thursdays are awesome. I think on our, our end, I mean, they're minor things, um, so I don't. I, don't I wonder if we should move it later in the month because we have trouble getting financials for the previous. Financials month. are always a, a month month late, and also like uh, things are a little discombobulated with vacations and things. Um, 
typically when they hit, so it might make things a little bit smoother. Um, we couldn't, I think we originally tried to do the second week from the start, but it conflicted with the select board meeting. But if, if not, it's, it's it's certainly livable. I just was. Thursday. I have four conflicts. You do.
uh, advisory board. Um, we had Meg Megan was serving and Ashley Lincoln. Um, Megan, would you like to continue serving? Yeah, I can do that. Okay, so can we have Typically, they should start right off like um, end of September, early October, so that they're concluded before we hit budget season. So once an agreement is reached, we know what we've got to add into the budget for the changes to the contract. I don't mind doing it again. I'd like to remain on it as well. And Hannah's going to remain. Do we have, um, so we'll, uh, do you want to vote this as a slate? So do we have a third person who would be willing to join that group? Okay, Chelsea Sprague, do we have a second for Chelsea? I'll second. I'll be seconded by uh, Katya. Um, anyone else interested? All those in favor of Megan Salt, Hannah Reyes, and Chelsea Sprague being on the teacher, con the teacher <laughs> negotiating, contract negotiating committee, please say aye. 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 Okay. Thank you. Um, and then next up we have the um, support staff contract negotiation committee. Um, that was uh, myself, Ashley, and Katya. Do we have someone interested in being on that committee to replace uh, Ashley? Frankly, it looks like you want it. I've done that one before a couple of times. It's the easier of the two. It's the easier of the two. I'll try that. I'll try that one. So Sarah um, will try that. Uh, Katja, you want to stay yeah. on? And and I'll stay on. So we'll we'll um, let's vote on that slate together. So that is the support staff. Uh, Contract Negotiation Committee being made up of Ann Kaplan, uh, Sarah Hopt, and Katya Evans. All those in favor say aye. 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 Did you have a motion? <laughs> We're kind of missing that. Oh, well, I'll, I'll make a motion. Okay. I'll second it. Okay. So all those in favor yeah. of having that slate of candidates, Ann Kaplan, uh, Sarah Hopt, and Katya Evans say aye. 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 Okay, so um, I'm going to move us, since that was sort of our the group organization part, I'm going to move us back in the agenda uh, to, um, well, the report on the town meeting you gave, Lane, unless you want to speak, do you want to speak to the the, um, the budget passed, as well as all the articles, um, in terms of how the surplus funds um, were going to be allocated. Um, the passage rate, the, the turnover, not the turnover, 
The number of voters that came out was about half normal, so voter turnout was low. That was true for the town elections as well. Uh, but it was about 80% that voted um, to approve uh, the school district's budget and all the articles. So it was a, a pretty good step. We typically we typically are like the 60 to 70 range, um, usually high high end of 60 to 70. So this was the I think the highest yet. I go back and look over the last four or five years. Okay. So next up on the agenda. Um, so if you remember back in this one? December <laughs> uh, when. <laughs> when we had talked about having, I guess it was maybe even November, having Jackie, uh, I forget her last name, Jackie, who is the, the um, policy governance uh, educator for the BSBA, she was gonna come and work with us, um, just in terms of helping us understand better our policies and how to work with them and to look at them in terms of whether or not we needed to um, make some changes to some of them. And then um, due to health issues, um, she, she had to delay, so um, we had to put it off. And she said she would be available after the election when we were back if we wanted to um, follow up and actually begin the training with her. So what I am uh, wondering if the board would give me um, the authority to just touch base with Jackie and then uh, with you all to kind of set up a date to do that training. Um, so I need a motion to I move to that. We authorize Ann Kaplan to arrange the board training with
ends, talk about ends, what they are, um, teacher, staff, union, negotiations, like how that works, um, just some of that basic information so that when you hear it maybe a second time, you're like, oh yeah, I remember that, I heard that last. <laughs> until you get a better idea. And I don't know if that would be helpful for the whole board to be there. At, when I was writing up the list, I thought that might be a little much. I mean, maybe it should just be us and the new board members since we are the committee. I don't know how other people feel, but it, the meetings stack up. So if it's just too many meetings, then I get that. I think it would be helpful for us all to review our role. And and it would be a public meeting, so if people were curious how the board functions, mm -hmm. they could. Yeah. Going over fundamentals. Or if they're interested. I feel like it needs to be timely, but I also feel like we need to wait until we have a fulfilled representative so that we're not doing mm -hmm. So I don't know if we can, like, we can wait until. You have to have an appointee by night by 30 days. 30 days. Yeah, I think I think they would be okay with it. You know, I don't think anybody would complain if it was next meeting. So maybe we'll schedule it at the next meeting when we have the new person, and then the three of us can get organized about the final. So what we want to do. So moving on, we have the uh, facilities monitoring report. That's um, in um, the system, unless there's questions that uh, you guys have that in the packet. Um, we'll be adding information in there about the uh, fire that occurred at Randolph Elementary a month or so ago. Uh, once we have a, a, a clearer picture of, of the work that's involved, um, we've had people coming in and taking a look right now, just making sure that things are safe. Um, one of the concerns was it was uh, the fire happened in a heating system. It was a component of the heating system and then it failed. And so what we want to make sure is because it's the same heating system in each of the classrooms, that, and they're all the same age, that if that, that one failed, that the others aren't about ready to go as well. And so we've had folks coming in and doing that inspection to assure us that, that um, things are in good stead. Um, apparently, uh, from what we can tell, the system that was put into that room, the unit, uh, it did not have a cowling cover over the component um, that failed. Um, had that been there, there wouldn't have been a problem. Um, so it was installed incorrectly you know, 20 years ago, probably, when it was put in. Uh, was the problem, so we're checking for that as well. Um, except for the $2,500 deductible, everything is covered under uh, Visbit insurance. Um, so kind of, when we talk about EL 2.6, that's part of the asset protection piece. Um, but it was interesting, um, the insurance company even stepped up and bought us like um, a new smart board um, to be able to use in the alternate location that the, the students are in to make sure that they could carry on. Um, I expect the total repair, I mean the damage wasn't a lot, um, but just given the supply chain issues, especially getting that heating unit, you know, we're probably looking at three months uh, as their estimate. Okay. Um, so, uh, 
um, just because of the, the lack of availability of materials. So, I'm happy to answer any of the questions that could be on. So what classroom was that in? That was uh, Nora Skolnick's classroom um, over at Randolph Elementary. So are they using it? She's using, not using that space. No, they uh, they have a very they have a very large um, teachers room um, up on the top floor that they're using right now that's been converted. Um, the fire marshals did give us permission to be able to bring in kind of standalone heat units, and so we are investigating that um, to be able to get back in the classroom and not the regular uh, you know, regular heat unit. That's one of them right there. Um, so it only heats that classroom. It's not affecting. Yeah, it's not affecting anything. Um, the fire wasn't that bad. It was against the uh, cinder block wall, um, so there really wasn't much to burn except for the insulation on the wires. It was I was there that night. It was mostly smoke. It took, took quite a while to get the smoke. Yeah. <coughs> okay. Um, sometimes it's incorporated into the report itself if it's logically fits. Otherwise, it is in a big binder that sits on uh, in the bookcase of my office. If anybody is welcome uh, to go in and take a look at. Does the audit happen every year? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. They stay. They stay far. Do we have a motion to accept EL 2.3 financial conditions? I move to accept the monitoring report and policy 2.3. I second it. Seconded by Chelsea. Is there any discussion? All those in favor? on this so um, and this one actually kind of plays in as well a little bit to um, you know decisions around COVID um, but basically executive limitations policy is ensuring that the district's tangible and fixed fixed assets are protected um, just as a reminder at the last meeting um, I am recommending that the board review provision five um, the provision was um, written a while back and it was designed to ensure that the district followed the law by going out to bid for any projects and purchases over $15,000. So basically, at the time that this was written, um, it was written using the language of the law. Recently, this last year, um, those bidding thresholds um, have now changed. Instead of 15,000, it's 40,000 um, if we're using our regular budget funds, and it's 50,000 if we're using federal funds. And so my interpretation has always been to follow the law in terms of what's required under bid. So it's kind of putting me out of sync with what you've written there a little bit. And so I think the recommendation that I have for the board is that either um, change the policy if it's the board's intent to have it match the law, um, or you know reject my um, interpretation, and then I will go back to making sure that you know we're using the $15,000 threshold as, as things are written. Um, so that's the first piece, so that's provision five. Um, earlier this year, this is about provision one. You know, we had spoken about the fact that there was no longer liability coverage against communicable disease exposure. 
Um, at the beginning of COVID, there was kind of a blanket coverage that you know districts um, could not be sued if employees, if, if students got sick um, due to COVID, and that was taken away at the beginning of this year. Um, the district spent an enormous amount of time trying to find this coverage outside of our main insurance carrier in Vermont, which is Visbet. Um, they cover all districts and schools, but it just simply wasn't offered and understandably why um, it wasn't uh, because COVID was so prevalent. Um, but this bit, um, after hearing the concerns from the superintendents uh, about this, was able to secure a limited liability protection for disease exposure. Um, it's very small, but it's something, and um, I've included that document um, as evidence in the uh, evidence folder um, for this, that we do have that coverage. It's like 100,000 um, 100, coverage, another 100,000 for legal fees. Um, the problem is, it's in a two million dollar pool, um, and that two million dollar pool is accessed by all districts in the state. And when it runs out, it runs out. So again, it's it's there's protection, but it's small. So I do uh, report compliance with the L two six. So what you could do is you could move for the change. Since it's policy, I believe you have to have two readings. Two readings. Okay. So mm -hmm. we can accept the we can accept your your report tonight, and then we can move the change tonight and read it. Do we need to read it two times after tonight? Two times after, because tonight okay. would be kind of establishing the language. Who's good with words? I was gonna say you saw your report uh, uh, tonight. The, um, well, first, can we in the meantime, I move that we accept what you what policy is this 2.6? Mm -hmm. I'll second. Second. Uh, and any discussion? Any further discussion? Okay. All those in favor of accepting the policy as it is? So you could, like I said, create the language and call that your first reading because you had a public discussion about it. Um, it becomes complicated though. I, I think the, the first reading would actually have to be the next meeting because the public should have an opportunity to see what the wording is ahead of time and be able to come prepared to have, to have public comment at the beginning. So. Might be easiest if, you know, as a recommendation, is good at the PH or let him. Yeah. Um, okay. I'm happy to secure that from you. Okay. Probably do it five minutes. Okay. Mm -hmm. So then the wording would be the wording we we have the wording at our next meeting, and then we have two readings after that. You'd have no. You'd have the wording because you would have that in advance in the of the meeting. As long as you're not changing the words. <laughs> yep. Um, that would be the first reading. Okay. That sounds good. First one has been good words. So is that typical when you make a new policy to have Pietro work with you? It's always best. I mean, we lots of times I will write things um, and then just I always send it for him um, through him um, just to make sure I'm not inadvertently um, by my language putting the district in the state of liability. Yeah. Okay. So it's it's usually good to have them check everything. 
Do we have to vote for you to ask Pedro to fix that? We gotta, we gotta authorize me. Yeah. Okay. So, and are we? What are we gonna? What are we gonna tell him to tell Pedro? Well, I move that Lane discusses with Pedro wording our provision five to include following all state bidding laws. I'll second. State and federal. Do we want state and federal? Or just state? Okay. Uh, yeah, because we, we receive a considerable amount of money um, in title funds every year, about, about 864000 So amend that to say state and federal bidding laws, please. And I heard All a second, second over here from Megan. Any other discussion regarding this? All those in favor? Yeah, so it's, this is a, a part of a, a good discussion. Um, so the governor, I don't, I don't know, it was probably shortly before 2 o'clock, um, made some announcements about, about changes, about basically lower restrictions. Um, the basic interpretation of it is it's leading um, to people in terms of their own recognizance and what, what they want to do. Um, Typically, when he does that, um, the Secretary of Education, Dan French, shortly thereafter, um, sends out kind of written guidance um, to us, um, kind of interpreting um, from the AOE's perspective what it was that the governor meant. And so I'll read you his guidance and, and talk a little bit about kind of my interpretation of it um, based upon what's here. It's not much and it's not necessarily all that clear, which I, I think is, is intentional to a, a certain degree. Um, Recommendations rescinded, uh, effective on that date, March 14, 2022. There will be no school-specific COVID-19 prevention and mitigation recommendations issued by the state of Vermont. Also effective March 14, advisory member memos, recommendations, and other communications are rescinded and suspended by following the general guidance. So basically what he's saying is, you know, all this guidance that, that, that you've had that we, the state has given you about what you should do, um, which we've taken as a mandate, um, because if it exists, if we don't follow it, somebody gets sick, we can get sued, all that goes away. So that opens up a lot of possibilities for us. Um, it goes on to say, general guidance effective beginning March 14, 2022. This is what we are charged with doing. And it's very simple. Schools should encourage their students, staff, and, and families to follow the Vermont Department of Health's recommendations for all Vermonters. We are to encourage them. So in my interpretation, that means we're not to mandate it, right? We are to direct them to where they can find information if they want to follow it. And so based upon this, um, what I will be doing, again, as we follow the guidance as much as we can, because it, it keeps us out of a state of liability, is updating things so that effective March 14th, all we are doing is encouraging students and all the other guidance, um, for the most part, goes away. I mean, I will still keep the guidance um, that we have developed around our HVAC systems and, and cleaning and things like that. Um, but in terms of masking, that would be my intent because that is following the guidance. That we have. So. Questions, thoughts? So the recommendation would be, so what that means is masks would be optional. It's, you, it's we, we encourage, we encourage you to follow what the state says. Right now, if you check on the state website, it is recommending masks. But again, it's a personal choice. Um, the way that I'm interpreting this is written. I'm happy students. The, I think, you know, in, in reflection, um, I think the people that would be the most concerned are people that are you know, potentially highest at risk, which would be our older staff. I don't know for sure on prognosticating that those would be the folks who might have the most concern. Um, 
Um, but as of you know, March 14th, it is the law. Um, and it's allowable for us to consider it an earlier date. But the reason for putting it off is communication? Uh, liability. So again, oh, until the it's, 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 it's a liability piece. So it's kind of the game. Uh, I'm, I'm going to express my own personal piece here with 30 years of experience. When they come out and they say that it's not mandatory, that it's a recommendation, well, yes, that, that they can say that. But the second that that guidance exists, if we don't follow it and somebody gets sick because we didn't follow it, we have no defense. Um, it exists. And so the best thing to do, um, at least in, in, in my mind, is to follow what they told us. March 14th, um, we encourage, uh, we don't mandate. It's a lot to digest, and the, the, the secretary's information literally came out like an hour and a half before the board meeting. So. Any, any ideas, a little bit of meeting, what the response from the union? Uh, I have not heard. It's new to everybody. You know, I made, made the commitment in the COVID, uh, in the COVID um, operating manual that, you know, we follow the guidance. Um, uh, it's, it's possible. So when they're, I'm curious, there are some other districts who have chosen to um, drop masking or make their personal choice. So those, in your opinion, and those districts are setting themselves up for possible I think it's unlikely, but it is a possibility. Um, I think the greatest possibility is coming, would be coming potentially from the staff. Uh, I think the, the time period as well um, makes a little bit of sense. One, because you know we've only been back to school for two days. I don't expect we're going to have a surge again after vacation, um, but it's possible. Um, the other thing that it will do is, um, you know, at least for some folks, it will provoke anxiety. Um, it gives time for folks to process um, and hopefully bring that anxiety level down um, a little bit more things go into effect. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank I'm torn between wanting to wait until the 14th or say we've got a lot of families who have shown opposition to masks and why wait if it's going to, I don't know. And not, nothing, no, no, nothing will offend me. No, no. Again, I'm, I'm, I'm following my, my charges based on policy. No, I know. I totally yeah. understand that. And I'm just thinking of, of the other side of the community who's going to wonder, you know, why we're waiting, what's the point in waiting. We have, a, we have our policy in place that, that will have students who don't want to wear masks any longer. There's repercussions to not wearing masks. So, it gets a little complicated too, um, because if it's all going away potentially on the 14th, it makes it a lot easier because it applies to athletics as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, if we try to do something in the interim, then the question is, okay, yeah, we're doing it for our students that are in school, but what about athletics? Do we need to do something separate in this? You know, we can have to be period. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. So what? What was their, what did they, did they give you any rationale for why they picked March 14th? You heard about it when we did. That's been part of the, you know, I, I understand, um, you know, trying to get a uh, solid message out, not having it diluted by, you know, leaking out a little bit early. But that's been probably one of the biggest complaints, um, I think, uh, is that, you know, we hear about it when, when everybody else does. So we don't get a lot of time to really plan everything early through. Like they said, this drops hour and a half, two hours before. And did 
you have a chance to connect with any other superintendents? Uh, I we had sent out uh, people. The yeah, the superintendents group was actually sending out emails back and forth about you know we're going to our board meetings you know tonight. We're not sure if you know we should be recommending to vote or not. Um, so when the government announcement came, uh, they weren't even aware at that point because most of us are busy. Uh, so I did. I sent the email out and just said, hey, just you know, he, he announced this. And it hasn't seen any guidance yet. I'm not sure what it means from the EOE's perspective. So it was just, like I said, it dropped on all of us today. So I'm giving you my best opinion I got, you know, right. sitting and, here for two hours. After. And so Dan French said basically he's, going to, he's recommending that the district encourage families to follow the Department, Vermont Department of Health. Yeah, so there's no school-specific guidance. Um, you know, I would send out a communication with a link to the Vermont Department of Health recommendations and then just say, hey, this is what we encourage you to do. Um, but you know the mandates would not not exist anymore. Again, we'd still have a COVID operating manual. Again, that would cover mostly you know cleaning ventilation things like that. You know what to do if there is a COVID case. In school. So if it's going to be personal preference after the 14th, and it could create issues between now and then for families and students. And conditions why, could change. I don't think they will. Right. Right. So. I'm just wondering why we don't say moving forward, you know, follow, we encourage you to follow the Vermont State VDH online. What, like, um, why don't we do that? You could, um, again, you don't know what the response will be from folks because you haven't had time for them to process, it's all new. Um, again, I worry a little bit more about the staff than, than um, the students. Um, the other piece that will come back is the CDC. Um, Right, the guidance from the CDC is that you know you continue to wear a mask indoors if you are rated in the high category, which Orange County is. So there's some con conflicting information um, between the two. So again, I'm just I'm just trying to get information to inform on that. Have you heard any feedback from the teachers, staff, anything? Since? Like I said, this was literally just yeah. before the meeting. Yeah. I agree um, with Lane on giving time for the community to process. It's um, one week, right? It's like a week and a half. Two, yeah. two weeks. Two weeks. I mean, I am all for taking the masks off, but also I have, um, I know a lot of families that have been deeply affected by COVID and they are still very sensitive to taking the masks off and what policies will be in place in the future. So I think giving um, those people that are sensitive to it time to process, I think is important as well. One of the things that, you know, again, because this is fast, I'm glad as you're talking, it's making me think, is that, you know, especially if it does provoke anxiety, and it will um, in, in some folks, it might also give us an opportunity to connect with kids with their counselors mm -hmm. that might be anxious about it to help uh, lower that anxiety. I guess the one thing that I, I keep going back to the union too is that if it's if it's prior, you have a likelihood of hearing. I'm assuming for the union. However, if it's the 14th, they really don't have much basis because it's following state guidance. So we likely won't have to deal with the. Their issue would be with the state rather than the that district. Are, yeah. 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 We'll we'll I appreciate the consistency of, of following the state guidance. So it's not anything about personal opinions. And well, it, it makes it easier a little bit. Um, again, I think one of the things that happened was I think genuinely, you know, when they were leaving a lot of it up to the districts, you know, in some part it was because, you know, conditions are different in different districts. In some part, it was um, there was going to be conflict no matter what was decided, so it pushed the conflict down to the school level as opposed to the state level making the decision. Um, I, again, my personal feelings is that that was potentially part of the calculus, but you never know. I'm, I'm interpreting. Um, you know, 
if, if left to my own devices, that's the, the path I, 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 I follow. That's another issue. This seems to me to be an operational issue. Right. Well, he's delegated to make that that decision on COVID, so we as a board would have to, uh, if we wanted to change this, we would need to decide to take back that uh, decision uh, to decide on the operational. Yeah. So uh, how would it would be to accept Lane's recommendation? No. You, you, don't you don't have to vote. vote. You don't have to vote. Because we've already yeah. delegated the decision making to him, he's just communicating to us what he's what he's decided, the rationale behind what he's decided, given the current guidance. And, and you guys had reserved to yourself, you know, the ability to change that, which is why we do the review. So you know, you do, you know, you do that, right? Uh, I think you know my next step um, will be, um, and I, I did this uh, at the last change that they had try to give folks a heads up that this is probably coming pretty quick is I'll pull together the, the cabinet, um, the nurses, and I'll pull more in um, as well as part of the conversation is, hey, this is this is where we're headed on, on March 14th, you know, how do we get there? Um, and so that will probably be, uh, I'll pull them together either uh, Friday or Monday. Get that planning piece done. Plus it helps, like I said, it helps with the communication, it helps with people have time, I think, to that, the process. a long time coming and I'm glad that we're at the point where this is going to be a reality. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm looking forward to it. It's great. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, so I think it sounds So you have the January financial statement, and again, kind of the rule of thumb is that, you know, given there's 12 months in the year, you would expect about 8% of the budget to be spent every month if we're on target. Um, the January financial statement represents seven months into our current um, fiscal year. Um, so it means we should have spent about 58% of our overall budget, but because of the federal reimbursements we've been receiving, and the ability in some cases to hire staff um, that we're planned for, we are well in the black right now. Um, you know, you would have expected us to have spent about 58% of the budget, we spent about 44% at this point in time. Um, there were a couple of things that stood out to me that I talked with Robin, our business manager, about today um, under the technology expenditures. Uh, the supply line shows us being overspent by $150,000. Um, but this is due to the cost of um, software subscriptions. We added, uh, especially last last year when we were remote, um, we added a tremendous number of different software packages for the different grades and different disciplines for the students so that the teachers could use them to help kind of enhance that remote instruction. We didn't know at the beginning of this year what things were going to look like. Was it remote? Was it hybrid? You know, how are things going to turn out? So we maintained those software packages. Um, but most of those um, that are there are, are reimbursable under federal grants, so that money will be reimbursed um, at some point in time. Um, under transportation, we're a little over the budget by about $7,000 on the cost of um, pretty much transporting our school choice students um, from Rochester. Um, we have a Rochester run and a Chelsea run that we send buses out to. Um, and a lot of that was due to uh, bad diesel fuel. Um, they shipped it out to us, guaranteed us that you know it had all the right additives in it um, so that it wouldn't clog up in the cold weather. The additives weren't there, and so every time that stuff turns to jello in the fuel lines, there's uh, you got to replace the fuel filters in the lines, and so it adds up a little bit, and so that's what that cost is about. Um, just since we're on the topic, um, Rochester, Chelsea, our school choice students that are coming in, they bring in $350,000. Uh, we have that many school choice and students that choose our, our school. How many students from each town from Rochester and do you know? Oh, I'd have to actually get you the actual numbers, but it's high. Uh, we're in the, we've probably got in excess of 30 students that are coming in. Um, 
Rochester is going to be small. I mean, their graduating class is worth 10 to 12. Um, so, you know, um, the majority of them are coming from Chelsea. We get a couple, a couple that jump in from Tunbridge on that, that bus. And what's the town on the other side? Chelsea, Washington. you got Tunbridge, and then on this side? Current, Washington. Washington. We get, we get a couple of students from Washington. Are these students that are in, in RUHS or RTCC? Uh, RUHS. Okay. So, so, unless there's other questions on financials, that's kind of... Is there any, is there any recourse for the bad fuel? <laughs> yeah, we've been working with the company to get it straightened out. Uh, they, they did come in and put in, put in, put in the additives. Um, I can talk with them about maybe reimbursing some of the, some of the damage. We actually had to send a few out to be tested and prove that they did not have proper additives. Yeah, I remember we had the days, yeah. Well, that, the, quirky, the, the quirky part was we got a little worried that you know, there was potential sabotage going on because um, there are some buses that are, they're all outside, but there are some buses that the people take home um, at night, especially for those runs. The only buses that we were having problems with were the ones that were stored up at the, uh, the bus garage that are outside. All the other buses that were outside we didn't have problems with, they all had the same fuel. And so it just, it was really weird to happen two days in a row. So I had heard that there were other places where fuel was delivered around that same time where the fuel was not yeah. good. So at first, because um, the town um, equipment uses the same fuel, the first day or two, they weren't having problems with their equipment either. Um, and their equipment is stored inside of their lock and key. So again, you know, we didn't seriously think that, but you know, there was a concern, okay, we're going to go out and get lock and gas caps and put them on there, because you know, we didn't know if people pouring a lot of the gas tanks were going on. But it turned out, as, as far as we can tell, just to be factual. I mean, not good, but good. Um, awesome. Okay. Um, any other questions on the financials? All right. So moving on. Uh, legislative update. There's. Yeah, I gave you a big long. I gave you a big long one in the superintendent's report. Yeah, that contract breaking. Is it really? Do you think it's going to go through? Uh yes. Um, I don't think it's going to go through in that form. Um, they keep a, a legislative log where people kind of update, you know, the current state of things. Um, and so I think what's happening now is that they are taking into account the concerns that, that uh, you know, the management has. Um, and so they're trying to see if they can meld the two together. So I, I think that you're going to see the time limit the teachers have to look extended a little bit, but I don't think it's going to be till till mid June. Um, so they're in that that discussion process to find out something that can you know, put the two sides uh, a little closer together. Um, it's just it's interesting because this is typically something that's collectively bargained at the local level, and this is the second time in three years that um, collect things that are collectively bargained and have been taken out of management's hands um, to the benefit of labor. So does our our agreement have a date currently? Uh, yeah, it's in it's in the CBA. The uh, so your contracts end at the end of next year, which is why negotiations start in the fall. And what's the date in our contract that says when teachers need to respond? Uh, I believe so. They they have to have their contracts by you know, like April fifteenth. Yeah. I believe they have 15 days from the time of receipt to return them. Otherwise, yeah. we can consider them all in to, to have been rejected by so the... So that's end. what's going to change, is they'll get it April 15th, and then you get to hang on to it and decide by... Yeah. We've been... Um, the other thing that happens, though, is that you know if a teacher is out looking and their due date is coming up, they have the right to write and ask for an extension. I've always granted the extensions, you know, within reason. You know, if you're... If you're in your third month of asking for extensions, you know, you need to make a choice, but uh, we've always granted the extensions. So why do you think this came to the, why do you think the legislature decided to take this up? Oh, you're, you're asking me loaded questions that 
Um, or, well, who, who brought it for? Uh, this was, I believe it was a Senate act. It came, came from the, the Senate. Um, I mean, the, the unions, um, and again, I, I respect the unions. I believe that there needs to be checks and balances. Um, but they are a big voting bloc. And so when they put stuff forward that I believe that is reasonable, um, you know, I think politicians seeking to get elected are going to go for it because it is a big voting bloc on their side. Now, in addition to that, um, I also believe that um, people are just uh, worried about teachers and worried about the turnover that might be happening this year. And I think that they were legitimately seeking a way to make uh, the profession more attractive. So they figured that this was a, a small something that they could give teachers so that, um, you know, it would keep them in the state, um, keep them in the profession. So I, th I think that was the real motivation. Any other issues coming down the pipe? I think that's the big one. Um, you know, the Act 173, uh, that was uh, changing how special education is funding going from a reimbursement model to a block grant model. Um, what ended up happening um, is that it's scheduled to go into effect um, this coming budget year, right? For us, that, that starts on July 1st. And um, they did a good examination to see, hey, um, how, how are people going to be affected by this? And so what ended up happening is about half the districts in the state are going to benefit from it. Half the districts uh, are going to lose out because of it. You know, in our case, we lost out. Um, we we were going to lose about two hundred thousand of the normal we would have received that had to be built into you know the budget that people just passed. Um, but there is discussion going on um, from the legislators about okay, these these districts that are going to be hurt um, by this change. Is there something we can do to mitigate that? And so what they're looking at is potentially taking a look at a three-year average of the funding that was uh, used by the districts and using that to give them their first kind of uh, block grant allocation um, in the hopes that, you know, it's not going to be a major deviation from, from what they want to receive. So that's, that was... Uh, and is the waiting, is the, the, the waiting of people, is that going to come up at all? It, and is that part of the... So they've, um, they, they are discussing it um, in detail, so that might have... Uh, an impact. Um, the biggest piece that they are working on um, is uh, the, the waiting for English language learners. Um, I think that seems to be where a lot of the focus is. Um, so, but they have been talking about the ingredients as well. Um, so yes, could have an impact. Um, that this, would have had a positive impact on our district. Uh, potentially, depending upon what they decided to do with waiting. Um, given, you know, the percentage of students of poverty. You know, our district on average runs uh, around 40%. Uh, and so, you know, if those uh, students are weighted heavily um, as a part of that, um, then, you know, you could potentially benefit from it. So, but those are in, in discussions. I don't tend to follow them closely because there's a lot of details, and they change so quickly uh, when they're discussing. I try to wait a little bit until it's more See if it's gonna final, finalized or solidified. We're moving right along. So uh, at the next meeting, we should have uh, 2.6 asset protection uh, Pietro's information in there. Um, you should have all received, um, we just got today the flag policy. So this isn't our first reading because we didn't really get a chance to look at it. So that will be on the agenda for the next meeting to, to um, discuss it as the first meeting. Um, but hopefully everybody will be excited and can start looking at it um, prior to the next meeting. There is a typo in the last paragraph. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I think I, think I, I caught it in, a, in an update. Um, the one question, um, about next meeting. So that would be the first discussion of the flag um, policy. Do you want Pietro here? Um, there are a couple of reasons for that. If there are um, weighty questions about law, he'll be able to answer them. 
The other thing that it will allow to do, you to do um, is if there needs to be just more of a frank discussion amongst the board members about it, uh, it would potentially allow you to go into executive session um, because if you're seeking his advice um, in a real frank discussion, um, we can go into executive section, session to preserve the privilege rights that you have in talking to the council. So I'll just throw that out there as a possibility. So board, what, what is our feeling on that? Yeah. Uh, so do we have a motion to have uh, Lane, or do you want, um, why don't we just have Linda set that up, or do you want, do you want to say I'll connect with them, if, if that's the, the board's choice. I, we, we uh, request Lane to contact the April about attending our next meeting, uh, specifically about the flag policy. Good night, everybody. is the Vermont School Boards Association works with its legal counsel, which is usually Heather and Pietro, um, to kind of create a model policy for districts to adopt. Um, what this deals with is this is Section 504 of the Americans with Disability Act, um, and it's a grievance procedure for students um, and staff. Uh, Section 504 uh, was really created to prevent discrimination against those with disabilities, making sure that they have access if you're a student you know, access to the academic programs um, within within your school. And if you're an employee, it was really originally created for, uh, for employees to make sure that they have um, access uh, to employment as long as, you know, the accommodations that are put in place to allow you to have that access are reasonable. Um, and so what this policy does is it provides an in-house conflict resolution protocol for folks um, who believe that their rights under Section 504 might have been violated. Um, and what's interesting is the, the process is almost identical to our current conflict resolution protocol. Um, so. I'm happy to try to answer any questions around it. I think this is the first reading. Should we fill in the blank? Is this the right thing? He did. Oh, you did. I'm sorry, okay. I didn't have that. That's okay. Yeah, yeah I guess if people were in and out of oh, vacation, so things are a little discombobulated. So the there is a is a version that have all uh, the parts and pieces. Of it. Yes. Yeah. That's sorry. That's okay. That's okay. Our 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 fault. And is this is this replacing a current policy? Or no. Are we just adding it into the to the required policy? I was trying to figure out why they were putting this in place. I mean the old the old standby is that look if um, you know if there's a disagreement over you know 504 accommodations or what's appropriate, you know, typically the, the next step in the process was you, you would refer um, the person to the Office of Civil Rights in Boston. Um, and so what it looks like they are trying to do is um, bring that process more kind of in-house to see if it can be resolved locally before going that step. People do not have to, to go this route. It's just, it's an option. Um, they can always still go to the Office of Civil Rights. My guess is, is that they probably have a lot of um, issues around this with COVID, right? You know, what do we accommodate for? Um, you know, if someone is COVID or if someone is, is highly susceptible to, you know, severe complications due to COVID. Um, so it's probably a response to the current pandemic. I, I don't know for sure that that's what Try to get resolutions quicker. Quicker. Are there any questions? Can you 
said you had Pietro review it. And yeah, it's the Pietro and Heather that usually create these so, for the for the state. Okay. So, do you have any other questions, or shall we move on? Yeah, I do. Okay. Next, we have um, several uh, minutes to approve. Uh, we have the minutes from our regular meeting on February 3rd. We have uh, minutes from the informational meeting on the 22nd. And we have the minutes from the annual meeting on February 28th. Um, and then in addition to that, we have the reserve funds request for the heating system that we spoke about earlier, correct? Question about the facilities for reserve fund requests? Yeah. So this is for um, this is for the air conditioning for, for field and brain, brain tree. I'm just seeing what the brain tree school looks like it's just limited to spaces that are not like students. I mean not student classrooms. Yeah. So what what are we? What's so it's the uh, it's the first step in trying to get um, full air conditioning into the, the buildings. Um, a lot of it, um, and we actually have them examining how to do the entire building. I think it's going to be about three hundred thousand per building if we do that. But we might be able to do that with the S three funds. A lot of the rationale behind it, um, and then we'll talk about why these specific areas. Um, is the larger pieces because we have constant humidity problems in there and um, end up with mold. And so, you know, if we can keep something running even at a low level to keep the humidity out, then that'll, that'll solve that, those problems. So that's an air quality problem. Um, the reason for the, these locations um, that are chosen is one, um, the cafeteria workers get extremely hot with the water boiling in there and no, um, no good ventilation. And then the essential offices is that there are people that are there year round in the summer, right? Whereas the, the students are not. And so it made sense to, to do those first. The one thing that I will say about this, which is, it's understandable given the times, but it's a little disappointing, is the cost to do this right now because of the supply chain issues is probably 40% higher than, you know, prior to COVID. Um, so, you know, these, you know, usually these heat exchangers are, aren't, aren't all that expensive. Uh, so these are a bit, bit more expensive than the norm. You said that this potentially, so the, the larger job we did at the school would come from SFI, and this is not? We're going to try to see if we can get that reimbursed. Through SFI. So it's not guaranteed, mm -hmm. but we're going to try to see if we can get it reimbursed. Um, but that, again, that's part of the, the discussion that we're having right now with facilities is, you know, that 300000 you know, if we wait, could be, 30 or 40 percent less if and when supply chain issues ever resolve. But you know, with the war happening right now, I don't see, you know, maybe five years down the road that might be possible. Um, and I do not want to end up with having to do a mold remediation two days before school <laughs> starts again, um, like, like happened to two, 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 actually three buildings um, just before we start school. So, good questions. Just that the um, legislative sessions, um, the work that they are doing, things change. Um, so you know there'll, there'll be a lot of a lot of updates until they finally get things right. Okay. Um, okay. Um, anything else from the board? Okay. Thank you. 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 
So um, in terms of the, the gift cards uh, were done previously because you know typically the, the board you know put a meal together for the, the staff. That might be possible this year. Um, nothing's guaranteed, but it looks like as of March 14th. So that's uh, so that, yeah. a possible consideration as you guys think about this. The gift cards were very well. When had that been in the past, that in person, like was it? Lunch, or was it? I think it was a lunch. Like snack. No, it was more snack. Yeah. 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 Was it well attended? Um, you, you just left them off, and yeah, I, I assume you're in the staff room. Oh, how many? Gosh. How many people are there? For staff, uh, 250. Oh, we could get 250 breakfast for you guys. From my favorite. <laughs> 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 Although we could use do gift cards to. Place and be, yeah. Uh, you gotta be careful about, around. careful yeah. about conflict of interest. You have to spread it around. Oh, we do. Oh, sorry. Yeah. But no, you, you could definitely, as long as it's spread around like that. Like, yeah. mm -hmm. I do know that the businesses um, did appreciate it um, because it helped them out during a, a tough time. So. I mean, I think if that was, I feel like if that was well received and it benefited staff and the local businesses. I think that's a really nice way to do it. Um, and I think it actually almost is a little bit more personal than us just leaving food in places. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. Um, so if we want to do that, I'm happy to work on that. If anyone wants to do it with me, I'll probably just have to ask Ashley what she did and see if she just wanted to help me But I'm happy to work on that again if we want to do that same model. We can pick. You know, if we want to choose four or five businesses in town, and then we'll do ten dollars, and then just do a, you know, assortment of each, and then everyone just gets what they get. And I think that sounds nice. Does anyone want to do that? We tell the audience to help out. Yeah. And uh, so we should probably just. Authorize Dr. and Sarah to put this all together on our behalf as the board. Um, so, do I have a motion to do that? I move we authorize Sarah Huff and Katya Evans to put together the staff appreciation plan and funds. So, I second it. Seconded by Chelsea. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. So action recap, uh, next meeting we will be, hopefully I'll have a date uh, back for us all for um, meeting with Jackie in the future to do our policy review and policy governance updating. Uh, we will uh, hopefully at that meeting be able to vote on to do a full board orientation to our work together. Um, and we will be doing uh, a first policy review of 2.6 asset protection after Pietro uh, takes a look at it and updates uh, number five, section number five. And we will be having the first review of the flag policy, we'll be having Pietro uh, available if we want to go into 
the executive session to uh, ask further questions uh, with him. And uh, maybe an update on how we're doing with our teacher appreciation thing if you need help or something. Um, and that should do it. Uh, next up, or any questions on what's going to be happening next meeting? Okay. Any, uh, uh, is Hannah, right? Doing the meeting evaluation? Yes. The evaluation? Okay. Uh, I think this was one of the most efficient uh, meetings that we've had in a while. We really followed the agenda. Um, I won't read down the list, but there are just a few things I wanted to highlight. We were very prepared for the meeting, and that's um, many thanks to Lane for getting us information so quickly, and Linda, uh, even when it's last minute information. Uh, scrolling down participation is very balanced. I want to give a shout out to Sarah Hopt, who is new and offered to do three things <laughs> RTCC, <laughs> support staff negotiations, and staff appreciation, which I just yeah, want to acknowledge because that's a lot to take on for new uh, And on the back, the board routinely spends time monitoring and improving its own process. I appreciate being reminded um, if we're voting on something or not, if we've given, if we've given authority or not. I think that's important and it's forever a learning experience for me. So, very good. 